I'm really excited to be talking to you today about some parenting strategies for supporting your youth, um, especially in the areas of anxiety and stress during the pandemic. So I had a slide here that just told you a little bit about me, but you've done such a great job introducing me. So I will not um, get into details on that. We can get right into talking about things. Um, so I wanted to start off with some statistics and just let everyone know kind of where things are at in terms of mental health during the pandemic. So a study was done by Sick Kids in Toronto in collaboration with three other agencies and their goal was to do research on 60,000 children during the pandemic. So this includes children as well as teenagers. Um, and although the final study hasn't been published yet, we do have some preliminary results already that we can look at. Um, so we do know that 70% of children and youth who were surveyed reported worse mental health during the initial spring lockdown. And they identified social isolation as the most significant risk factor for worsening mental health. And overall in the population, we know that typically 20% of people struggle with some sort of mental health issue. So that would be about one in five. But during the pandemic, this number has doubled. And we now have about 40% of the population struggling with some sort of mental health issue. So you can tell that mental health is one of the big issues that's come out of um, the pandemic. And as I was saying before, it seems that social isolation seems to be having a really big impact, especially on adolescents. And one of the main reasons for this is that bonding with peers and finding a sense of belonging is a essential developmental task of adolescents. So it's what teens are kind of programmed to be doing, connecting with peers and finding a place to belong. But as we all know, um, youth are really struggling right now with finding ways to connect. And although some of them um, are feeling confident in connecting with their peers online, not all of them do feel confident in doing that. And some of them, um, even though they are connecting with their peers online, it's just not the same type of connection that they're able to form. So a lot of those informal opportunities for connecting with peers are missing right now. And this is one of the factors that is impacting youth mental health currently. So the current reality is that teens are experiencing a lot more social isolation and a lot less social interaction. So I've already talked about the reduced social interaction opportunities, but we're seeing teens engaging in more social isolation as well. So even in their own homes, they tend to be isolating more to their rooms, watching Netflix, engaging online, but spending less time um, in common areas. There is higher levels of stress in families and higher level of fatigue in general in families right now. Um, and we all are sitting with uncertainty, a great deal of uncertainty, which is really uncomfortable for many people, right? Like from an evolutionary perspective, we are kind of pre-programmed to be uncomfortable with uncertainty. A long, long time ago, if we were about to enter a cave and we felt uncertain about what we might find in that cave, we want our body to feel uncomfortable with that prospect and give us warnings and, and send messages to our body like, hey, stay away. So we're kind of pre-programmed to feel this discomfort with uncertainty. And right now is a time of increased uncertainty for our teens and for ourselves as parents. We're also in the situation where we are all doing more avoidance. So we are um, kind of asked to avoid a lot of things that teens may have found uncomfortable in the past, right? So maybe teens felt uncomfortable with like ordering something in a restaurant, having to speak up for themselves or having to speak with the cashier uh, when they went grocery shopping. But teens are engaging a lot less in those behaviors and able to avoid a lot of uncomfortable social interactions or other uncomfortable things in their lives um, because of the restrictions that are currently happening. 
And as we're going to be talking about today, the more we avoid things that are uncomfortable for us, the more discomfort we feel towards those things. So re-engaging in those behaviors can be problematic and difficult. Um, we, as a whole, are also engaging in a lot less physical activity because there are less activities available to us to be able to do. Um, and this can also have an impact on mental health. We'll be talking about the importance of physical activity in just a little bit in this presentation. So what can we do? I've told you kind of how things are at, and now what is it that we can do about all of this? Well, one of the first things that we want to do is send the message to our teams that it is okay not to be okay, right? We're all in the midst of a world pandemic. It is uncomfortable for lots of people. Lots of people have increased the stress right now. And it's okay that we are going through this. So it is important that we give youth the space to vent and talk about how they feel and validate their feelings about these experiences. Um, so for many parents, when our teens are struggling or, struggling or when our children are struggling, we kind of want to jump in and fix it. We want to take it away. We don't want them to have to struggle. Um, we want to, if there's an issue and they're struggling emotionally, we just want to make it go away. And there's lots of potential reasons for that. And we'll talk about it later, but even from an evolutionary perspective, right, we're kind of geared to help take care of our children and help protect them. So we jump into responses that are more fixing it kind of oriented rather than validation. So for example, if our teen was to say something like, I can't handle this anymore. I don't think my friends like me. I never get to see them. As a parent, we might jump in and say something like, yes, you can just Set up some more time to talk to your friends on Zoom. I'm sure they still like you. Which you can see it's got lots of really good intention here. The parent is trying to help the child see another perspective of the situation. Um, but the teen themselves might feel as though they're being invalidated and that their feelings are being minimized and that they're really not heard, which leads them to feel more disconnected than connected. So we wanna make sure that we give our teams that opportunity for connection. So instead we might wanna say something like, it sounds like you're feeling really overwhelmed, right? It's okay to not be okay right now. So we wanna validate that for them. It sounds like you're feeling really overwhelmed and you aren't feeling confident in your relationship. So just because we're telling them that we're hearing what they're feeling doesn't mean that we're necessarily agreeing with them. It just means that we can hear that this is what they're experiencing right now. And this helps them feel heard and understood. And even though it doesn't take the problem away, it leads to that sense of connection and belonging which we want for our team. And often teams are quite capable of solving the issues that they have, but they want to be heard. We all want to be heard when we're struggling. So we also want to make sure that we can understand and make space for the losses that they're experiencing. Because a lot of teens feel like they have lost something due to the pandemic. I'm thinking, you know, grade eight students that I've been working with are telling me that they had looked forward to starting grade eight because this was their opportunity to be in high school and meet so many other kids and make new friendships. Um, but the way that the system is set up right now, many teens are finding it difficult to connect with others. There isn't that informal lunchtime where they can meet new people um, and in their classes because they're 10 weeks, there just isn't as much opportunity for uh, building those relationships. Grade 12s may be feeling down because they're not sure what graduation might look like this year. Um, and lots and lots of other things that teens are feeling as though they're missing out on. And so we want to respond to them with empathy and compassion for their experiences. Because, you know, from an adult perspective, maybe not making friends this year doesn't seem like such a big deal because, you know what, they'll make friends next year. But for their subjective experience, this is a big deal. This was important for them. 
and this is what their their lived experience is in this moment and so we want to let them know that we can see that it's hard for them and that we can understand that so we are wanting to send a message to our teens that it is normal to feel uncomfortable and anxious during this time you and your family are responding normally to a really stressful situation. So we want to make space for these feelings, um, but we also don't want to overly focus on them to the point where we can't be doing other things in our life. So on this slide, I put a beach ball to signify this metaphor that I like to use. So I want you to kind of imagine that this beach ball is your feet. And what we want for teens is to be able to kind of have that beach ball around without trying to take it and suppress it under the water. A lot of times when we do that fixing, like, it's okay, don't worry about it, you'll feel better, um, no big deal. We're kind of like suppressing those feelings. We're like, let's kind of get those out of here. Like it's, it's, it's a lot, we don't want to deal with that. And so we're kind of suppressing those feelings, but what happens when we put a beach ball underwater is that it pops right back up and it doesn't actually work because it'll keep coming back up over and over again. We also don't want to take the beach ball and hold it in front of us and not be able to see anything or do anything because that's the only thing we're focused on. So we want to help our teens know that they can kind of have that beach ball hanging out without needing to focus so much on it that they can't do other stuff in their lives or suppress that beach ball so that it keeps popping back up and overwhelming. So how do we do that? Some of this requires us to start role modeling that ourselves. We want to role model for our teens this acceptance of feelings that are uncomfortable, right? The beach ball is going to come up because this is an uncomfortable period of time. And we know that the beach ball is going to be hanging out and around. And we want to show our teens that we can let the beach ball hang out without overly focusing on it or trying to suppress it. So we want to role model for our teens for example, that we can tolerate uncertainty um, and we can tell them, we can talk to them about our own discomfort with uncertainty as it comes up. And we can highlight to them that this is hard, this is uncomfortable, but it's also manageable. Instead of but, maybe it should be and it's also manageable. So these are hard feelings, these are uncomfortable situations, and we can handle them. And we can deal with them. Right, so it's like that, that message of both, right? Like, yes, you're gonna experience all of this discomfort right now and we can handle this. Another thing that we can do is role model our own self-care, whether this means that you are going to get out into nature or connect with your own care, friends for support or get physical exercise or schedule massages or whatever it is that you choose to do for your own self-care because the way that we are managing our own emotions has a huge impact on our children and our teens because they look to us um, and they can sense what we're experiencing right we don't have to be even talking about our own discomfort our kids and teens will kind of know if we're experiencing that discomfort so we want to make sure that we're demonstrating to them how we are tolerating these difficult emotions and managing through them, even though they are difficult and unpleasant. All right, so now let's get more specific about anxiety. So I've been talking about feelings kind of in general and mental health, but let's talk about what anxiety is. And the way that I like to talk about anxiety is to explain to the child that I'm working with or the teen or the adult that I'm working with exactly what is going on. So I use the analogy of a fire, uh, of a smoke alarm. So we all have smoke alarms in our homes and the reason that we have them is because they can alert us when there's a threat so that we can do something to protect ourselves. So for example, if we all decided to go for a hike in the woods today and we came upon a bear 
we would want our alarm system to go off so that we weren't like, oh my gosh, look at this cute cuddly animal, let's go pet it, right? We want our alarm system to tell us, danger, danger, you need to do something, you need to deal with this threat. So our alarm systems are helpful, they help protect us, They've been around for a very, very long time, right? I talked about that cave with uncertainty back in the past. The uncertainty led our alarm to go off so that we could get out of there and we wouldn't go into these deep, uncertain caves. So super important. But have you ever seen a smoke detector that goes off and there isn't a real fire? So we've got the alarm ringing, telling us that there's danger, but there isn't a fire. So maybe someone is cooking something, right? So we would call this the sensitive alarm system. Well, inside of our bodies, sometimes people also have these sensitive alarm systems that go off at the wrong time when there isn't real danger, but our alarm is telling us that there is. And that's what we're talking about today in terms of anxiety. So the alarms that are going off for all sorts of different reasons, whether it's genetic or whether it's um, because a traumatic event has happened, these more sensitive alarms are ringing or because of the amount of uncertainty kind of in the environment right now. So just to be clear, we have these alarm systems in our body. Evolutionarily, they're helpful, but some people just have more sensitive alarms than others. So the anxiety response involves the physiological response that we have that we often think of as anxiety. So what's happening inside my body when I feel anxious. But it also involves certain thoughts that we have and as well as what we do when we begin to experience anxiety. So let me show you what this looks like. So my first thought might be, my friends don't like me. And this could be a pretty typical thought for some teens. My friends don't like me, which is going to lead me to experience something physiologically. It could be anxiety. I might feel embarrassed. And that is going to lead me to want to avoid peer interactions because they're uncomfortable. And it might lead me to isolate more, which in turn will lead to even more thoughts, which might be like, I'm not spending time with anybody. It's so clear that people don't like me, which is going to perpetuate the cycle and make the cycle kind of continue and grow and increase one's distress. So I'm going to be breaking down each of those different areas and suggesting strategies for them today. So how do we deal with the physiological aspect of anxiety? How do we deal with some of the thoughts that come up? And how do we deal with some of the behavioral stuff that might come up with anxiety? But before we do that, I wanted to tell you parents what you might want to look for in case you're worrying that your child might be experiencing anxiety. So these are some of the common red flags that we look out for to know if someone is struggling with anxiety. So the first one is experiencing distress out of proportion to the situation. So it might be a situation that you wouldn't expect such a large reaction to, and you would see lots of crying, sadness, anger, hopelessness, hopelessness or embarrassment, and kind of the same reaction to multiple situations. Children and teens that are seeking repetitive reassurances and discussing numerous what ifs. What if Lisa doesn't call me tomorrow? What if I do badly on this test? What if I don't get into university? What if I never get a boyfriend? What if I never continue and continue and continue? Or asking for that repetitive reassurance. So are you sure that I'm healthy? Are you sure that there's nothing wrong with me? Are you sure you love me? Um, and other types of reassurance. It, are, is, are you sure that today at three o'clock we're going to the doctors? Are you sure that later this is happening? So those types of reassurance questions excessively, right? Headaches and stomach aches that don't have a medical basis. For those of you who have kiddos that are struggling or teens that are struggling with anxiety, you know that anxiety often shows up inside of the body as headaches and stomach aches because we carry it often in our body. The kiddos with the constant worrying. So kids that have a hard time turning that off. So worrying about everything and anything, lots of different topics, 
but really struggling to turn that off. Having a hard time sleeping, whether this is falling asleep, staying asleep, nightmares, or having a hard time sleeping alone. Perfectionism for those teens who want everything to be just perfect. They work really hard on their assignments, but it may be taking way too much of their time to be getting their work done. The teens who feel overly responsible or are overly organized, and this looks great, right? The teen is really on top of everything, but it's causing them a lot of distress to stay so on top of everything. And if anything changes, there isn't very much flexibility that we're seeing. Avoidance of expected activities because anxiety often makes us avoid, right? Like if I'm afraid of heights, I'm not going to be scheduling lots of activities um, that involve heights. So I wouldn't choose to go visit the Capilano Suspension Bridge because that would make me feel uncomfortable. And we're designed to notice that alarm and leave because it's supposed to signal a threat for us. So a lot of us engage in avoidance when we feel scared. Some of the other symptoms that we might see when someone's experiencing anxiety might be angry outbursts. So I've called these the frequently overlooked symptoms because they're not usually what we think of as symptoms of anxiety, but they definitely can be, right? Because when that alarm system goes off, it sends us into fight or flight. So part of that is that fight component. So we might, we might see them experiencing these angry outbursts because it's like you're pushing them into a situation that for them is the equivalent of hanging out with that bear that I was talking about earlier. So you might see them reacting with a great deal of anger, um, as well as the oppositional and refusal behaviors. We might see hyperactivity and difficulty sitting still, right? Because there's that physiological component associated with anxiety. Um, and so some teens, you might see them kind of moving around a lot, having a tough time sitting still because they're hypervigilant to their environment. And then struggles with attention and concentration because if I'm constantly kind of out looking for threats or worrying about something, it's gonna be difficult to keep my attention and focus on, on other things. So how can we help our teens with dealing with the physiological response to anxiety? Well, one of the things we need to do is just take care of the basics, right? We need to make sure that our teens are getting enough sleep that they're eating a healthy diet, and really importantly, that they are getting out of the house and getting some exercise. We know that exercise can have a huge impact on one's mental health, and so making sure that this is something that is happening, and this might mean that you need to connect with them and get them out with you, going for hikes or whatever it is um, that your family is going to be able to do together or on their own if they're open for it, but it is crucial that teens get out and exercise. And even just the rhythmic movement related to exercise for some teens can be really helpful, especially in those moments of really intense anxiety. Some of the other stuff that we can do is help reduce boredom and isolation. So this might involve connecting and reducing isolation in the home. So asking your team to come out and watch movies with you instead of by themselves in their bedrooms, uh, engaging in more board games together, ping pong, whatever activities that you can in your home to help with connection. Um, continue to engage in routines and plans that you already have, right? A lot of our routines are a little bit off but we can establish new routines and help stick to them to help reduce anxiety around uncertainty. And then having interesting things to do at home because that's where the teens are spending a lot of the time, a lot of their time these days, whether it's online activities, art and craft supplies, books, helping them find a place that they can volunteer so that they are doing something with their time. And then to help manage that physiological response related to anxiety, we want to help our teens learn how to engage in relaxation. So helping them learn how to do some deep breathing. Um, and you know, I explained that when the alarm goes off, our body goes into fight or flight. So there's a bunch of things happening physiologically inside of our body. And using relaxation strategies, we can 
kind of give them something to do while all of this is happening and to a certain extent reduce how intense the physio physiological symptoms are being experienced in their body. So debriefing can be really helpful for teens. I've got progressive muscle relaxation on here, which is an activity where you tighten various muscle groups throughout the body and then release them. Not only is that really relaxing to do, so a great activity to do before going to bed, but it also helps teens recognize where they're holding stress in their body because a lot of us hold tension in our body. So it'll help teens recognize like, oh yeah, my shoulders are feeling really tense and helping them learn how to relax those muscles when they need to. Yoga, of course, can be really helpful in terms of relaxation um, and connecting with one's body and mindfulness activities. These are really important because a lot of the time what happens when we're anxious is that we live in the future. We're thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen in a month. Um, but mindfulness activities help bring us back to the present, which can help reduce our anxiety. But a lot of these strategies that I'm talking about need to be practice a lot before they're going to be effective when a teen is experiencing really high levels of anxiety. So we don't want to be trying to teach a teen how to do deep breathing when they're in the middle of like a panic attack, for example. So we want to encourage them to be doing these at night when they're calm or in the shower or whenever they're feeling nice and relaxed and calm and have that extra time. And there's lots of apps out there now, nowadays. So um, the MindShift app, I highly encourage for your teens. Smiling Minds is an excellent app for uh, mindfulness and relaxation strategies as well. So getting them to practice these and using them on a regular basis. So as I mentioned, there are three parts to the anxiety response. And we have spoken about some of the things we can do, do for the physiological responses. And now I want to take some time and talk about some of the stuff that we can do to manage the thoughts that come up when we feel anxious. So as I've mentioned, our brain is really helpful for us to survive. It, designed that way to help us avoid things that could have hurt us in the past. And so it does have this tendency to focus on the negative, right? You've got to watch out for every potential danger and watch out for any potential mistake so that we don't do it again. So that's where our brain is going to go and focus. But the thing is not everything needs our attention because not everything is a threat in that way. So we can learn to help shift our mind off of focusing on all of the negatives. Also, just because we think something doesn't make it true. And this is something that is really important for our teens to be made aware of because a lot of times we give so much importance to the thoughts that we have. But on average, we have about 3,000 thoughts an hour. So not every single thought is something that we need to explore and engage with and try to understand or try to solve and it doesn't necessarily reflect something super meaningful about ourselves. So we need to help our teens recognize that thoughts aren't facts and we don't necessarily need to engage with every single thought that comes up in our mind. So we can help our teens learn how to alter the way that they're thinking to help reduce their anxiety. And importantly, we can also help recognize our own thinking and how that might be impacting our team's anxiety, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I'll give you an example first of how we might, um, we might want to consider helping our team. So I mentioned, I used this example before, my friends don't really like me. If that's kind of what our team is thinking about, it might lead them to experience anxiety or feel embarrassed, which might lead them to want to avoid and isolate, which again is just going to perpetuate the cycle. So after a great deal of validation and compassion and empathy that we're giving our team, we can also help them recognize that, you know what, we don't really know what our friends are thinking um, or feeling. 
And a thought like this might help our team feel a little bit less anxious, less embarrassed, maybe just enough to lead them to actually reach out to their friends. So when teens work with therapists, sometimes they learn this type of thinking. There's also lots and lots of resources on how to learn to shift to this type of thinking on the Anxiety Canada website. So you can help your team connect with it if it's hard for you to help them learn how to shift this type of thinking yourselves. So just in terms of when we're trying to counter our thoughts, some of the things that we can do is put the thought on trial. So, okay, you know, after we do some validation to our team who is saying, my friends don't really like me, we can say something like, okay, well, what's the evidence that they don't like you? You want to make sure you cover the evidence that they don't like them and not just the evidence that they do like them because otherwise they're going to feel as though you're not, you're not hearing them. So you want to put this thought on trial and hear both sides of this argument. Okay, so what's the evidence that your friends don't like you? Okay, what's the evidence that they do like you? Because then you're at least bringing in another perspective and not having them focus just on that thought that is making them feel very anxious. So we can help our teams put the thought on trial. We can help our teams focus on probability versus possibility. Now, many, many, many things are possible. So we can easily get stuck on being really anxious if we're thinking about the things that are possible. Is it possible that the light in front of me falls onto my head right now and kills me? Yes, it is possible. Is it likely though? Really unlikely. So it's probably not something that I really need to worry about. So helping teams kind of differentiate between things that are possible and things that are likely can help reduce anxiety. And one of the ways that we can do this is asking them to provide us with some of the other possibilities and situations. Of course, after we do some validation of their current experience. So you're worrying that you're going to do awful on your presentation tomorrow. What are some of the other possibilities? And just having, again, bring in some balance to that um, focus on the negatives can be helpful. Has this been true in the past? So what's it been like for you in the past when you've done these presentations? Just helping bring in that past experience of like, well, oh yeah, actually every time I've done it before, it's actually gone quite well. And then, like I said before, that recognition that thoughts aren't fact just because we think we're not going to do well doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to do well just because we think that Lisa doesn't like us doesn't necessarily mean that Lisa doesn't like us and the last one here is reminding ourselves and our teams that there's something that we can do right when we're doing all of those what ifs which a lot of us do hard not to. What if? What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? It's really easy to get really caught up on trying to solve all of those what ifs. Well, what if um, the bus doesn't come tomorrow? Okay, well, if the bus doesn't come, I'm going to call dad and dad will do this and that. And then, and we can get so lost in these thoughts uh, while forgetting that these what ifs haven't yet even happened. Uh, and so what we want to do instead is remember that if an issue comes up, we're actually quite resourceful and we usually deal with them relatively well and we handle the situation. So maybe we don't need to plan for three hours the night before and we can wait until the day of and manage situations when they arise. And so helping your team recognize those times that they are able to respond to a situation even without a great deal of planning is helpful for them so that they can remember that in the future when they're struggling with all of those what ifs. And teens often are very surprised when we get curious about their feelings and about their thoughts because a lot of the time they're trying to fight their feelings and they're trying to fight their thoughts. They don't want to have them. They don't want to feel them. 
Um, but instead, if we can be like, hmm, I wonder if your thought is trying to tell you something, or I wonder if that method or that feeling is here to deliver a message. Um, it can be really helpful as well to kind of shift that perspective of why it might be here instead of something that we need to fight off. Um, so recognizing that, you know what, actually some anxiety can actually be helpful. It might be telling you that uh, it is important for you to do well in this class. And so it might be kind of knocking at the door saying, hey, you need to be doing some of this work that can actually be functional anxiety. It's when it gets in our way that we begin to worry about anxiety because we all experience anxiety to a certain extent and we would expect our teens in various situations to experience a certain degree of anxiety. So just getting a little curious about what do you think it's telling you? Do you think it's pointing to a particular value that you have? So that thought before about like my friends don't like me, maybe it's here to kind of remind you that friendship is really important to you and maybe there's some stuff we want to be doing to help you reconnect with that because it is important to you. But as parents, we also have our own thoughts that pop up. And some of these thoughts might look like this. If she struggles to work, get her work done now, how will she ever go to university? If he is too scared to speak in front of the class, how will he ever manage a job? If they struggle to stand up for themselves, how will they manage their marriage? What if they struggle as much as I have? So this is when we are getting caught up in their experience of anxiety and projecting it into the future. So we're kind of doing our own what if. If this happens now, what if it's going to impact them in all of these horrible ways as they get older? Or we might be over-identifying with their experience of anxiety. I struggled, I'm seeing them struggle, and it's bringing up my own discomfort with this struggle. And this type of thinking makes it really difficult for us to respond to our teens when they're experiencing anxiety. Because now we're off in the future and exam experiencing like worst case scenario for our teens. So we want to work on bringing ourselves back to the moment as well. And, you know, great opportunity to role model dealing with some of these thoughts, bringing ourselves back to the present. Oh, I thought I had another little thought here. Um, how about I focus on today and this particular issue and I'll deal with the future as it comes or I'm going to focus on Billy's experience of anxiety because we aren't the same. So instead of kind of jumping into the river of anxiety with them, we're going to stand out and help support them and be present in the moment and deal with the, the tiny or the incident that is happening today. Not necessarily a tiny one, but deal with the incident that's happening today and focusing on the small wins that we have every single day because if we miss out on those little wins, like Lisa was, the only example that popped into my mind right now was Lisa was able to sleep in her own bed last night. Um, I know we're talking about teens, so it may be that uh, Lisa was able to order for herself today at Starbucks. That's a win, right? If, if you have a really socially anxious child, that can be a big win. We wanna focus on that win. But if we're focusing on like, what does this anxiety mean for their future? We might miss out on those wins because we're so focusing on something that hasn't even happened yet. So we wanna bring ourselves back to the present, recognize what's happening today and help support our team with the small steps that they can accomplish today. And of course, celebrate those small steps when they do happen. Not, oh, there's the bubble. I don't know what the future will bring and I can focus on these and I can't focus on these what ifs. I need to focus on today. Okay, so we have covered the physiological response. We've covered some of the thoughts and let's talk behaviorally. How can we help support our team? So as I've mentioned, 
anxiety is going to make us want to avoid. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's triggering fight or flight. It's making us want to get out of there or you know, wanting to fight and get angry and aggressive. It's, in any case, it's making us uncomfortable. So we want to not engage. But unfortunately, the more we disengage with the things that make us feel uncomfortable, the more our fear grows of those things. The more space we give fear in our lives, the more it starts to take over. So if we at first give it this much space, it's going to be like, but now I want this, now I want that, now I want this. And so we may have started with feeling really uncomfortable going in elevators to not even being able to look at an elevator because it brings up so much distress. So it has a tendency to grow. What we want is to help our teens approach the things that make them feel afraid, but in small, gradual steps. And we want to make sure that we can praise and reward our teens for facing their fears, because as anyone with anxiety knows, it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, and it's really, really difficult. And we also want to role model this for ourselves, right? We want to, if we're telling our teens to face their own fears, then we're going to have to do some of these things as well so that we can show them that this can work and that we really do believe that they can do it, that we can do it, and that this is okay. So let me tell you why doing the things that makes us feel uncomfortable or anxious is helpful. So if you've heard me talk before, I tell people about my fear of dogs, uh, which I do have. I am quite afraid of large dolls. I watched Chucky when I was about seven years old. And that fear has kind of stuck with me. So when my daughter was about three years of age, she received this alpha doll that was probably about four feet tall and she got it for Christmas and she really liked her alpha doll. And she would really like to play with this alpha doll in my bedroom. So she nicely tucked it into my big bed and um, for some strange reason, she liked to sit it up right um, and lift her arms out. So when I would come home, especially you know during the winter when it gets dark, Earlier in the day, I'd come home and I'd flip on the light in my bedroom, and there will also be just staring at me with her. She had these huge eyes. Anyway, so Elsa would be staring at me from my bed, and that would make my alarm go off. So, this is what it would look like. And you can see that there is an increase, and I'll use my mouse to show you here. So, there's an increase in anxiety, right? And it happened quite quickly. I would experience that alarm inside of my body. And then I would call my husband and I would say, hey, could you get Elsa out of my bed? And because he is very accommodating to my anxiety, he would say, sure. And he'd come and he'd get Elsa. Immediately, I would feel relief, which is very reinforcing, right? It's why we keep doing this because it feels good to feel the relief that we get when we avoid the things that make us feel anxious. So the other thing is that the little alarm inside of me that was ringing is now doing a happy dance because it thinks that it just saved my life. It made me get away from a huge threat according to the alarm and now I've survived. So the next time that I come into contact with Elsa, my alarm is going to go off again, for sure, right? It saved my life last time. Why wouldn't it do it again? But this time it's going to ring louder because it was dangerous and it protected me and it did such a good job. So now my alarm is ringing louder. My anxiety has grown. Then I call my husband. He's accommodating to make my anxiety go away. I'm relieved. Happy dance for my alarm. But then, of course, the next time I came home, my alarm would continue to grow. Uh, my anxiety would continue to grow and my alarm would continue to go off. So you can see here how our anxiety grows over time if we don't engage 
and if we avoid the things that make us feel anxious. So let's see what would happen if my husband didn't accommodate my anxiety. So instead, my alarm would go off, right? It would still increase because it's uncomfortable. I don't like Elsa. She makes me anxious. My alarm would grow. But over time, my alarm would decrease on its own. Our alarms aren't designed to kind of last forever. So we would expect it to decrease after a period of time. And what would happen here is that my alarm would be like, oh, she didn't die. Maybe the situation isn't as bad as I thought. Maybe next time I'm not going to ring the alarm. I wish it just stopped ringing altogether because it would make treating anxiety so much easier. But the reality is it's just going to be a little bit more quiet. So we'll still get anxious, but just not as much as before. And then again, the alarm would be like, oh, nothing bad here. Okay. And then we do this over and over again until we no longer experience anxiety to the situation. And not only that, but we're also learning that, man, I can handle a lot of anxiety. It's uncomfortable, but I can definitely manage through it and still do things that are really difficult. And so helping build my resilience for future situations that may make me anxious and uncomfortable or stressful. So one of the very important things that we can do is help our teens recognize that they need to learn how to ride the wave of anxiety. Anxiety is going to come up into our bodies. We're going to experience it, but over time, it's going to decrease. And we can continue doing the things that we want to do or are expected to do that anxiety tends to get in the way of because over time, I will begin to feel more comfortable with the situation, especially if we do it a lot. So as parents, we can help encourage our kids to do the things that make them feel uncomfortable in small steps. And it is very possible that they'll refuse. They'll be like, nope, I don't want to do that. Um, and in those situations, we can help reduce our own accommodations as parents, right? Because if anyone has a child who has anxiety, you know that there are things that we do to help reduce our kids' distress. So we can work on identifying the types of things that we're doing in the family to help accommodate this anxiety and then work on reducing it. And it may be that you are buying only certain foods because other food makes them feel anxious to eat or um, you are speaking for them or emailing teachers for them because it makes them anxious to do that for themselves. Um, you may create your work schedule around you being home more because they're anxious to be home alone or away from you or whatever the situation. And so we want to reduce those accommodations over time so that we can help our kids recognize that, hey, anxiety is uncomfortable, but it's something that is going to happen and I can handle it. And over time, whatever it is that made me feel anxious is getting easier. So I wanted to share with you um, the Anxiety Canada website because this website has excellent resources for parents and for teens. They have a whole section designed for teens and it's really interactive and um, kind of speaks the language of teens. It has videos on what it might look like for a teen to experience anxiety. It has teens of, uh, sorry, it has videos of kids talking about what they feel inside their body when they have anxiety. It talks about how to help teens face their fears. It even has videos of teens facing their fears so you can see that yes, it's uncomfortable, but after a while it gets easier and easier. They have step-by-step um, -step strategies for managing anxiety and uh, they also talk about the mind shift app, which I was telling you about earlier. And the MindShift app is excellent for teens. They can download it onto their phone. 
it has relaxation strategies on it. It has, um, we talked about those thoughts and how to challenge those thoughts. So they have um, different statements that teens can use to help themselves recognize, you know, what is the evidence that I have for this situation? What is the evidence that I have for a different situation? Um, or helpful statements that they can read, you know, you don't have to be perfect. It's okay to make mistakes or stuff like that that can help challenge some of those anxious thoughts that come up. And um, it also has a section encouraging teens to face their fears and breaking tasks down into smaller chunks if it is something that is very overwhelming. So I have an image of the youth section for Anxiety Canada. You can see it's themed at teens. <clears throat> And so in conclusion, there is a lot of different stuff that we can do to help our teens manage their anxiety, starting with managing our own emotions, showing them that we can handle discomfort and distress because we can handle discomfort and distress. We're all dealing with a lot of discomfort and distress right now. Helping our teens learn to understand what's happening physiologically inside of their body and learning strategies for relaxation and breathing. Uh, mindfulness as well. We can help our teens learn how to change the way that they're thinking to reduce the anxiety that they may be experiencing. And the biggest piece of today, helping our teens learn to kind of ride that wave of anxiety, knowing that anxiety is going to be something that kind of comes up as the wave they experience in their body, but will recede on its own and they can continue to do the things that make them feel uncomfortable um, or anxious because over time they get easier and easier. So I am, um, this is me. And if you have any questions after today's presentation, I am happy to answer any of those questions. You can email me um, or give me a call. But now I'd like to open it up to you for some questions.